and we're taking a look at the ocean's economy, uh, one of the pillars of uh, Operation Pakisa <laughs> that uh, the government launched in 2014 to fast track and get big results for our economy. The potential is there, 3,000 kilometers of coastline, vast oceans that are untapped, and uh, this ocean's economy can provide, it's believed, something in the order of a million jobs by 2033. But how are we gonna do it? Let's explore that. And one of the areas of um, potential is uh, Transnet, the uh, Ports Authority and uh, its operations uh, wing. And there you'll find a good number of careers uh, that are being developed because to make these, this operation uh, world class, it requires world class skills. So we have a table uh, here with uh, some qualified people uh, who are doing amazing things at Transnet. And I wanna uh, join, ask them now actually uh, to, if we can get a microphone to them, just to get a sense of um, what's possible and I think there's Portia Mia there. Portia, if you're there, if you could just stand up and get the microphone. Now, Portia, you're a, a tug master. Now, what on earth is a tug master? Are you pulling people all day? <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. Okay, let's just check if the microphone's working. Um, just say something again. Good morning, everybody. Can we get another microphone? <coughs> All right, so we have Portia Mia, who is a tug master. So Portia, tell us, what does a tug master do? Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me this morning. Um, I am a tug master in the port of Durban. Basically, I operate a $60 million craft, and I dare say Lotheni is one of the best tugs we have in Durban. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we help the ships come alongside, because when a big ship comes into ports, the water is very shallow, it's not as deep as the ocean, so they need assistance to come alongside or to come off and leave. So our job is to make sure that they dock safely. All right, so you've got a $16 million craft to do this. That's correct. Wow, so you're insured, hey, and you've got power steering. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> All right, so I suppose an analogy, just to help people at home, is that perhaps at the airport, you often have these trucks that pull the planes into various positions, and that's what you do. That's correct. We use... Um, a wind that has a towing line, it's a really thick rope and has a really big breaking strain. All right, so this is quite a skill given the value of uh, equipment that you use, but the, also that you're tugging. How long is the training for something like that? It's quite long. <laughs> yeah. You have to be committed and know what you want. Because I first started at DUT, studied maritime studies, went to sea for about two years trained there and qualified as a third mate. So I have a ticket to sail on ships and to be a navigation officer. Once that was done, I came back to the port and trained as a tug master, which takes two years. Wow, fantastic, it's great to see. And again, it also uh, a good thing to see uh, is uh, that women are getting involved in doing, I suppose, what was traditionally very male jobs. Well, next to you is Chief Engineer, Koliswa uh, Sidzumo. Uh, Koliswa, if you could uh, get the microphone. Uh, so, you know, when we talk engineers, a lot of the times we thinking about people building bridges and uh, fixing roads and buildings. What's a marine engineer? Uh, we work in the tugs. We do maintenance mm -hmm. and we run the engine room so that Porsche can run, can control it to do whatever she does. <laughs> So you fix things? Yes, we fix things. Yes, All right, so that you're not wearing this lovely top. You've probably got overalls when you're... <laughs> well, we have to make it look nice. <laughs> Again, another traditionally male-dominated environment. It, it, with people like you, is this changing quite a bit? Uh, yeah, it is changing. Yeah. And even now, people are still not used to females mm. doing it, but... Well, I think they're getting used to it. <laughs> so do they let you do some of the heavy lifting as well? Yeah, we do heavy lifting. <laughs> they so, have lifting equipment and 
Yeah, yeah we don't work alone. Yeah. There's everyone else doing. So what sort of qualifications are required if I want to follow a career in marine engineering? Uh, math and science at school, and then you go to, I went to CPUT to do marine engineering. But some start with mechanical engineering and then branch off to marine engineering. But I did straight marine engineering, and then after that I went to C to get a class three. That's training for 12 months, and then after that you go to the port, and then you do training for two years. It took three years, though. How did you even hear about marine engineering? I mean, you know, this is... Well, I saw boats, and <laughs> I wanted to work there. <laughs> but then Transnet came to our school when I was in high school. I was doing grade 10 to introduce marine maritime right. as a whole. Then I took it from there, and then when I got to school, I wanted to do the engineering side instead of the deck officer. All right, so we're going to come back to your table again a little bit later on uh, because there's uh, some more uh, people doing interesting things. If you want to know what a dredge master is, we'll find out in a short while. But I, I guess this is, Mr. Valley, this is what's kind of yeah. important for you A, empowering women, and B, developing all of these skills, uh, but getting mm. young people in our school system to know that these careers exist. Mm. Well, we find that, you know, um, that women are far more focused and less distracted than men. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we're very proud of our ladies yeah, here. Yeah. Um, just to give you some, some more statistics, last year uh, we had about close to 550 graduates wow. from the Maritime School of uh, Excellence, which is based here in the port, in the old Durban airport, but we've got satellite campuses mm -hmm. in Cape Town and in, I think, P and in Richards Bay. But uh, the interesting point that Mike was making about, um, you know, you, you talked about the budget yeah. of Transnet, uh, and we have a market demand strategy. So we create capability ahead of demand. Right. So, you know, when the demand does come up, we are ready for it. In the ports itself, we have a, a budget of 60 billion over the next 10 years for that platform and that economic enablement that we want to do mm. in all our different eight ports. And we have another port that we are um, looking at building um, just north of Saldana, which is called um, uh, Port Nollet. From scratch? Yes. Wow. Well, it, it, it yeah. used to be a port, yeah, but okay. we're just rejuvenating okay. it for, for the local community there. Uh, uh, but the point I want to make is that, um, you know, uh, we are spending a lot of money in Transnet, when we don't get it from you know government coffers, we go out there and we earn that money, and of course we want that same type of investment to come from the private sector as well. So you know we need to hold hands if we want to really make this economy work, together with Transnet and and, and uh, private sector participation. But the important thing that uh, Mike was talking about was about local localization and industrialization in South Africa. And we started with the locomotives that we are building now, and we are building them in Bayet, in Durban. And the thing about uh, localization is that it is actually seamless. You know, the technology can be applied not just to locomotives, but also to tugboats, dredges, uh, all of these vessels that we are building. So we have a number of different shipbuilders in South Africa who are looking at localization. We are. We have put out a contract to one of and uh, the gentleman that you were referring to. They are building our tugboats. We've got um, a contract for nine tugboats with them, built here in South Africa. Wow. So the tugmaster is driving uh, a tugboat Locally that is built in South Africa, Fantastic. right, by a local company, SA Shipyards. And we are stressing upon them that in terms of the supply development, we want to see an industrial hub being formed around that kind of development not just you know, in Pretoria, but here in Durban, mm -hmm. in Saldana, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's very important. And that talks to marine transport manufacturing. Mm. So it, it's a very important thing that we do because that capability doesn't come easy. There is a great deal of um, school fees to be paid. It's expensive. Mm. But once you get that kind of capability, you, know, you, you start to see um, uh, uh, a spawning right. and it has a catalytic effect on other industries. So, you know, that's the kind of thing that we are also encouraging. You know, so the training is the one thing, building capacity and capability out of demand, yeah. but also bringing in 
all the other plays and we are trying to be as inclusive as possible okay. going forward. Brilliant. Okay, well, let's hear some more voices from the floor here, uh, starting with Mike Maduna, who's on table number two. Uh, let's get a microphone to Michael to uh, get your thoughts on this uh, ocean's economy. Michael? Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity. I'd like to ask two questions. With the move of smart ports that's taking place at the global stage, what is Transnet doing to improve ports efficiency, in particular container handling? That's the first question. The second question says, in the country we have a drive for a radical economic transformation. Apart from the expansion of the ports that's currently taking place, what is Transnet using as a technology to reduce road and port congestion? Thank you. Okay, two very good questions there. Gentlemen? <laughs> okay, let me just take a stab at that as okay. well. Um, we have come to understand the role of the fourth industrial revolution, which is the digital revolution. Mm -hmm. And we've, it's part of our pillar, one of our pillars in Transnet, you know, going digital. And um, I'm glad to say that it's not just talk. You know, we've just completed a proof of concept in the port of Durban, where we looked at a whole range of different sensors and actuators, and we've pulled them together. And we call that the smart people's mm -hmm. port. Because for far too long, we have kept the communities away from the ports. Now we want to include them. And at some point in time, we will be having free industrial Wi-Fi, whoever comes within the port precinct. So they would understand what's going on in the port, what opportunities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, now you know this Internet of Things that people are talking about mm -hmm. is something that we need to embrace. And if we get that um, embedded in our systems, how much more is it going to improve our efficiencies? And if it does improve our efficiencies, mm -hmm. it improves our throughput, which lowers the cost of new business. So you know the um, the consequence of embracing that is very important. Um, this um, smart ports that the gentleman is talking about is something that we're now going to uh, be establishing in all our ports. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just so that you get an understanding of it, um, we have now drones in the ports. And we were one of the first ports in the world to introduce drones. Underwater drones and drones that go around looking at mm -hmm. a number of different things that we want to assess. Part of it is congestion in the ports, right? Mm -hmm. We're also looking at how do we go about using this smart technology to understand where we are in any given ecosystem. Mm -hmm. We've got the trucks, we've got the straddle carriers, we've got the containers, and there are gigabytes of data that's being generated. And how do we then harness that to form some kind of intelligence for us to make sure that we improve our throughput? So this smart port concept is not something mm -hmm. that is new. We have already got the proof of concept bedded down, and now we're going to be rolling it out. So okay, and that answers part of the second question, which is the decongestionalization or dealing with congestion. Yes. And it can only get worse if we're only at 10% now of world uh, It can only movement. get better. Yeah, yeah. It, so the congestion problem can get worse, in other words. So you can be using this drone technology and other smart technologies to manage that. Yes. Okay, all right. Jabulani Ngubane is on table number 15. Jabulani Ngubane, table number 15. Thank you very much. Morning, everyone. Uh, my question is based on security in terms of port terminal, terminals. In the last three years, we've lost more than 3,000 rhinos in this country. Last year alone in KZN, we have lost 162. I just want to understand, in terms of, se of your security and detection at, uh, at your port, how do you make sure that the syndicate does not breach your systems and, and exploit uh, Transnet in terms of the mode of transport, taking into account that three years ago in the U.S., uh, more than 100 tons were confiscated in their uh, port, and then they were directly linked to South Africa. Thank you. Mr. Guel, how do we make sure that we're not exporting rhino? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a challenging question because our principle works as follows. Uh, once a container is loaded and is sealed, 
we endorse this thing, and it's what declared to the state. And only if there's interference with the scene, then we raise alarms. Two, the responsibility actually lies with the border police, the SAPS. So what government did, they created a special unit focusing on, on ports. They deal with these kinds of crimes. It goes worse than just, uh, than just uh, potential uh, uh, rhino horns. There are even human beings called stowaways, where we, we, we find ourselves importing foreigners, getting into the country legally, mm -hmm. using these vessels, and probably using our, our, our terminals to leave the country as well. So, so, so is it border police that is responsible for that? But obviously, Port Authority also has got a lot of security on the ground where they've got systems in place, checks and balances. But as you are aware, uh, with those crafts, like those that you observe around Medenoff, where the host of foreigners that even the state can't deal with them. So it's a question of how we deal with these things on day-to-day -day basis. Unfortunately, it's the reality we have to deal with. Okay. Bonga Khadebe is on table number 13. Table 13. Bonga, if you can get a microphone to you. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I have just one uh, simple question. For a young African child right now in high school at Engandla, what business opportunities are available if they want to come and engage and do business with uh, Transnet? Thank you. Okay, so I mean, Engandla. <laughs> and I'm in high school. And what business opportunities are there? And how do you help me? Well, there are a host of opportunities. Uh, if I may start, first let's start with equipment. Most of the equipment I have is very sophisticated technology. In most cases, it's foreign sourced. But obviously what we do, we force for localization. So there's, there's, there's potential where we can pair them with foreigners on the localization aspect. Localization would be either a direct participation in having a stake in that business, or in certain cases, it would be skills transfer, where you come in, having nothing, you leave as a, an electrical or mechanical engineer. Mm -hmm. So one aspect is that the other one, I think I touched a little bit on SMMEs. I have said there are areas that are not capital intensive in terms of starting that kind of operation. Those are areas like Steve Doring, driving function, and so on. So those areas are available. As I speak to you, probably in the next week or two, there will be a bid out mm. for driving function for the entire country, which will put Elizabeth, East London, and Debit. So that brother or sister, young one, that's in Kandla, can also put uh, uh, in for that bid and there's opportunity. So yes, we've got massive, uh, 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 complex jobs, but yeah. we also got small scale, less capital intensive, less barrier to enter. All yeah. right. Kwesi, your area, the, the, the barriers of entry, perhaps a little more challenging because the level of skill required is quite high. How well, are we dealing with this? Where do people even train? Well, indeed, uh, I think I must, I must clear something, yeah. uh, Peter. I think when people think of people who work in the peace and security sector, they almost always think that uh, we're basically referring to people that are with the security services, mm. soldiers, police, intelligence, mm. or, uh, and, and such like. But I think that uh, what we do is to actually manage information. Um, and this is the information that could be of use to institutions such as Transnet and industry at large okay. in terms of understanding the reasons for the threats and risks that they face. Um, there was a, a question that was asked about uh, security. Mm -hmm. And of course, the answer, I think, was appropriate. It's the responsibility of uh, that specialized um, uh, South African police border uh, unit and what have you. But what we fail to understand is that by the time the crime has been committed, a chain of events, which are not even within South Africa, have occurred. Which then means that when we're talking about how to exploit the opportunities available in terms of this blue economy in South Africa, we need to be shifting our eyes, casting our eyes beyond our borders. Mm. Because by the time uh, 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 this, this vessel gets to South Africa and it contains uh, all manner of undesirable things, uh, somebody, some authority somewhere mm. would have 
participated in the commissioning and, and, uh, of, of, of a particular crime. So when we are looking at the rest of the continent, for example, or specifically, we need to be looking at how industry and some of our institutions would participate and encourage more information sharing, more intelligence sharing, and perhaps more importantly, in the investment in the rest of the continent of some of the capabilities that are world class that South Africa has. With the number of people that are being trained in South Africa, for example, through Transnet's program, uh, one would think of a variety of countries that would not be in a position to even think of a training program as advanced as this one. Why is it that uh, if South Africa wants to benefit from the, or unlock the economic potential of the continent in terms of the blue economy, is in Transnet thinking of developing a joint training program with some of the port authorities across the continent? I can recommend quite a few. So these are the realities yeah. of, of the work that we do. It's not any form of wizardry or anything that much specialized. It's about recognizing that in the instance of the blue economy, there is a lot of information that is not science or that is not technically inclined. Mm. That is required in order for the decision makers that lead this particular sector to take into consideration. Okay, all right. We'll take another break and then when we come back, I want to get a, a sense of uh, the private sector, uh, some of the challenges they're facing and what their thoughts are. We have a few people here from shipping associations, uh, shipbuilders as well. Uh, let's get their thoughts and also meet uh, a dredge master. All of that coming up. <laughs> 